Well, hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So we are underway with our webinar. And so hopefully we have some folks here joining us. I'm John Nash. I'm Beth Rouse. <laughs> and we have the chat open for folks. And so if you want to post a question, please do. Um, and we will uh, get underway here, I guess. So uh, yeah, again, I'm John Nash. I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky, uh, and I specialize in research on human-centered design, and particularly the way in which design thinking can be used as a lens for leadership in thinking about change in organizations. So, yeah. And I am Beth Rouse. I am also a professor here at the University of Kentucky, and I spend most of my time working around uh, research on issues of young children and children with disabilities, specifically looking at the way programs are designed and the way programs are taken to scale at a state or national level. Um, cool. Well, uh, we should also say that this webinar is co-sponsored sort of uh, by our good friends in Australia with the Early Childhood Intervention Australia. Uh, a group we will be joining later this month uh, at the Inclusion Symposium, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, but let's uh, just introduce a bit about the topic we're going to talk about, which is inclusion and design thinking. Um, we'll spend about 40 minutes or so here talking about that, and we'll chat for a little bit, and then we're going to open it up to uh, your questions. So please pose a question in the chat. Uh, we already have a good morning from Mudgy Preschool, so yay. yay. <laughs> Excellent. Good to see you guys. So um, yeah, Beth, let's just start on the inclusion side of the house. Um, talk a little bit about what inclusion is from your perspective as we think about the problem. Yeah. So as John and I have chatted over the um, actually last few years, um, when we talk about inclusion, and I think this is similar across, um, across the US as well as countries, we really think about inclusion as the degree to which children have access to and are able to fully participate in, in their settings. Um, so we use the definition of the Division for Early Childhood and National Association for the Education of Young Children, which came out in about 2009, um, talked about the, the um, access and participation. But we also have a third component of that, which is the supports that are in place um, to help providers and those working with young children um, to, to fully include them. Um, yeah, and uh, in our conversations about how inclusion works or doesn't work, <laughs> we came to the realization that there might be something to design thinking in the way it frames challenges and tackles problems that could be useful in improving inclusion. Absolutely. And so as John and I've talked over the, over the last few years, I kept coming up with this question of we've been doing this for a long time. It's like inclusion's not new. It's not new for people with disabilities. Um, but for some reason, we continue to struggle with how to make that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we began having some conversations around why is it that inclusion might be hard? Um, we know how to train people. We, mm -hmm. we know what we want. Um, but for some reason, we have some, some problems actually articulating that um, into real life and what happens. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're going to frame some of our remarks today around a blog post that we put up uh, with uh, uh, ECIA uh, in New South Wales and but first maybe we should do our poll we have a little poll to give Absolutely. so let's see if we can get that going and see if we can get some sense of where folks are whoops that's the Q&A I want to do the poll there it is and I'm going to launch the poll yeah, so you all will hopefully see some questions up here and we're going to watch and see um, see when folks have had a chance to weigh in on that, and then we'll show you the results. So yeah. You can see what you've said. So go ahead and click. We've got two questions. One is, what brought you to the webinar? We're curious if you were interested in knowing more about inclusion or you wanted to learn more about design thinking. And also just wondering if you happen to read the blog post. It didn't get publicized everywhere, so it's fair for you yeah. to even say, 
what blog post. So, uh, but that'll give us a sense if anybody's sort of on there. Good, it's coming in. We've got, what, 44 people at least on, the, uh, yeah. on here right now, so that's good. Give it another couple of seconds. We'll stop it at about one minute. We got, make your vote if you haven't. You got five seconds left. Yeah, that's good. Very good, all right, we'll end the polling and share the results. Yeah. So now you're viewing the poll results. So um, about 40% of you came to learn about inclusion. Cool. Yeah. And uh, all 97, did we let them choose both? I think we did. We did. All right. We so did. and everybody so. wants to know something more about design thinking. That's so, cool. Yeah, really cool. So and some of you did actually catch the blog post and most of you are like, what blog post? So that's fine. So we'll cover a little bit of that. And we also put the link to it uh, at the top of the chat window. So if you want to check that out, you can. So great. So I'm going to stop sharing that. So we'll get to it then. So, so Beth, say a little bit more about what you noticed um, over time. You, you know, you've said that you've been doing, you, the royal you, have been doing this for a while, <laughs> trying to make inclusion work many years, and yet it just doesn't seem to be where you'd like it to be. What, say more about that. Yeah. So I think, and I'm, I will talk specifically from the U.S. perspective here, but I think over the years as we've implemented early intervention services as well as preschool, preschool special ed services, um, I think it's fair to say we've seen a bit of a decline um, often in the, in the children who are able to receive those supports in mm -hmm. inclusive settings. And so we don't know quite why. But one would think that after 20 years of trying to help kids and designing programs to help them um, receive their services in inclusive settings, we'd be a little further along and that 100% of our kids would do that. But that's not, not really true in the U.S. But I'd be really curious for those of you that are, that are out there to um, post your comments in the chat about whether you think we still have a problem realizing full inclusion of young kids. Um, and so that really began my kind of quest in chatting with John about what is going on <laughs> with this thing of inclusion. I think, I feel like we know what we're, what we're doing and we have some ideas on how to make it work, but we're not really getting mm -hmm. as far as I think we might, um, with this, yeah. uh, with this issue. Yeah. And the thing, and the thing is, is when we start talking about the, the, the nitty gritty of why inclusion seems tricky, we were struggling to come up with a framework to say, because it's felt like it was so many things. And then um, I reread an article that I had in my files that I've been thinking about, but it's um, Riddle and Weber's uh, piece from the 70s on defining wicked problems. And we started going through the criteria for what makes a wicked problem. And wicked isn't to mean that it's evil or awful, but rather tricky and complicated and hard to get your arms around. And so uh, when we started to look at their criteria for what constitutes a wicked problem, we couldn't help thinking that inclusion stacked up pretty good as one. And so um, it was right in the middle there, these two Venn diagrams, here's inclusion and here's design thinking. And it looked like wicked problems was in the middle there and maybe they were, could complement each other. And so I think it's Ellen, I think your comment is, is right. Um, and we can talk about that um, today mm -hmm. in terms of, it, there are many things that impact whether inclusion works or not. It's just not one thing. Um, and, you're, mm -hmm. and you're right, it's training, it's attitudes, it's the resources. Um, so it's, it's not a one, sh kind of a, a one click fix <laughs> in yeah. terms of making inclusion work. And, so. and that goes to the first point we were chatting about in the piece we wrote, which is that every wicked problem is essentially unique, which is, for me anyway, I feel that that's sort of freeing because that lets me know that, okay, I don't need to find the one common solution, but it's also a little uh, daunting because it tells me that every, solution, every situation is unique, therefore the solutions are going to be a little unique and probably then a little harder set of work, right? Yes. Absolutely. And so if we think about um, 
every family that comes in the door with the early intervention or in early childhood special ed, they have very unique needs. And, and actually the families think about inclusion differently. Um, mm -hmm. And so where um, me as a parent who had a child in early intervention, um, I might have wanted my child to be um, receive their services in a hospital and not necessarily receive their services in child care because I didn't have confidence mm -hmm. in the child care providers. And another parent may really want their kid to be included in every aspect. Um, so every child and family, every child is different in terms of their needs. Every family is different, and yet we have to come up with the package that works for all of them um, in in a setting. So that makes it a little hard. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things we noticed about inclusion that makes it kind of a wicked problem is that the solutions that you come up for, for families, for children, for providers, are not, they're neither good nor bad. Right. They're, they're, um, there's no true or false to any of these solutions. They're a big, they're a big mess in a, in, a, in a good way sometimes, but other times, it's hard to disentangle them yourself, right? Absolutely. And so if you think about, again, that family, um, if you come up, if the family says, this is what I want for my kid, um, and I would like these kinds of services in these kinds of settings, it may feel really good to the family, but the early intervention provider, the early childhood educator might be like, oh, that's not full inclusion. It doesn't feel so good to me. Um, so what are the ways in which we mediate that and, and realize that mm -hmm. there's, that, you know, there's not one good answer um, so, um, yeah. to, to the problem. Yeah. I think that, uh, and we're going to talk more in depth about each of these issues and how design thinking can address them. But um, I think that the other thing we noticed was that uh, inclusion is a set of nested issues. When you want to unpack a challenge inside inclusion, the first thing you look at is actually the symptom of another thing behind it. And so um, how do you know where to start? Exactly. And I think Ellen talked about that yeah. in, her, in her chat. You know, Ellen, you're spot on when you said it's so many things that, that we have to think about. And so where do you start um, in terms of, is it, is it making sure we have the workforce that has the skills and knowledge and that happens before the administrative support or do we put a bunch of resources in there and then that works? Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, how, where, where, where do we start in untangling the mess and, and how do we begin to address yeah. that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then... Uh, this last piece we talked about is sort of this idea that the planner has no right to be wrong. It's kind of a heavy burden that uh, special educators, teachers, parents all have because they want to do right by the child. And so you have no right to ever be wrong at anything. I know. And so if we don't include these young kids early on, does that really impact their journey long term? And, and then we think from an early childhood perspective of all the times in a child's life when it should be the easiest to include them, it, it would be in early childhood before they get to school age programs. And so it should be easy, but it doesn't feel easy. Yeah. So kind of what, what do we do about that? Yeah. Um, um, I'm wondering if folks out there uh, listening are thinking about some of these points and whether they sit with you or whether you think they're, what aspects of inclusion do you think are the trickiest, at least in terms of making it better? we would be interested to have you uh, put some of that up there. So, good. Well, then I think then we should think about then what it is we might do about those those things. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so part of the the beauty of uh, thinking about this from a design thinking perspective, um, I really felt like I understood inclusion. But when um, John began to talk about this idea of human-centered design, I was thinking mm -hmm. of it from the perspective of um, person-centered planning. And so how is it different than, than what we do in terms of, of those components? Um, and so I think John can give us a little bit of information about why human, why human centered design, why design thinking, and what are some of the basic tenets of that that might help us think about inclusion in a slightly different yeah. way. Well, firstly, let's talk a little bit about sort of the position we're coming from here when we talk about design thinking. There are lots of stripes or flavors with that. Um, and so we're thinking about a process that can start with 
a, a set of activities that we'd call need finding or empathy, where we are trying to learn about the needs of others. And in the case of inclusion, um, and one of the mindsets that we like to uh, possess as we go forward is this notion of radical collaboration. And so when we think about empathy with those that are most affected by the policies and practices of inclusion, we're thinking about small children, but we're also thinking about families, we're thinking about teachers. And so we're reaching out to learn a lot about those people's lives and what they like, what they don't like, what they hope for, what their wishes are. And then take those findings and put them in a, uh, a position where we can really define the challenge that they're facing that's most critical or most important at that time. And it could be, as we noted, every problem is essentially unique. It could be different from setting to setting, but we try to distill it to their needs. And then once we understand that challenge, we brainstorm solutions to that challenge uh, and then pick the best or most promising ones out of that brainstorm and try to test those out. So that could be curriculum, it could be uh, classroom space, it could be policies at the, um, at the highest levels even. Uh, you're a systems person, a policy <laughs> systems person. So um, we've even dabbled in using design thinking to rethink you know, state level policies for providers and so early child, early care and education. So, you know. And so the empathy process, I think John, help us think about that from an inclusion perspective. And yeah. so it's, as most people in early childhood and early intervention know, we, we are trained as experts. <laughs> we come into this being taught kind of how to work with young kids, how to work with families, and we're trained in this idea that our goal is to support inclusion. Um, and so we're experts. Um, so I guess part of the, the design process then is what, when, you, when you're the expert, how do you do need finding and how do you build empathy? Um, right, right. That's just one of the challenges we have when introducing this innovative technique to a body of folks who are experts but are frustrated with the way status quo systems present solutions. And so, yes, um, well, they, the first thing we try to do is have people suspend their own uh, notions of beliefs about how the system works. And they have to actually think about the user, we call the people that we're designing for users, the users as the experts in the room. So this means now the, uh, uh, certified professional early care provider is now beholden to the expertise of say a five-year-old girl uh, whose life we really need to get to know what is it they're interested in what they what they cherish what they don't want and then understanding that they have to suspend their own notions of expertise and belief about how families are and just listen to the parents and listen carefully about what their needs are and what how the system is working well for them, how it isn't working well for them. And so, because when they can do that, then they can sort of step back into the skin of their professional lives and integrate their professional knowledge, which is very important, but integrate it with those, uh, those field findings that they've gotten from talking to the, the people that they want to help. So that could be a little scary. That can what, be a little what scary. What if the people you're designing for think something very different than what we as experts think? Well, yeah, that's that can be that can be an issue. And so, while we're saying that we want to involve the voices of the the children and the families and pract other practitioners, other lay people who understand the system but are not from a purview of an expert. Um, while we're saying we want those views, we're not saying that we're going to let, as it were, the inmates run the prison. So uh, you don't get to have any solution that they want, but that a good design process involves understanding the user and what their needs are and judiciously mixing that with uh, uh, the feasibility of an idea, uh, budget constraints, uh, regulatory constraints. We're not, you, you, we can't put out solutions that break the law, for instance, right? But, we can and usually do uh, discover solutions that have not been thought of before and are very sensitive and effective from the eyes of the organization and the users. 
So in, in looking at some of the questions yeah. that, have, that have come in, so this language around inclusion being more inclusive and, and what are ways that we can use more mainstream language, um, that's kind of an example of, of how we might um, bring the voices of those who are included to bear, right? Yeah. In terms of how, how we even define this concept of inclusion. So we as, we as um, experts think of inclusion and we've come up with this definition of inclusion as access and participation. What would happen if we ask kids to define inclusion from their perspective and what that means yeah. or families to define inclusion from their perspectives? Yeah. I mean, it might change. It might change. And so then not only do practitioners have to be prepared to hear those ideas, but they also have to be prepared to think about how they might uh, operational those, uh, those ideas or implement those ideas. Absolutely. So that's an area where design thinking, some of the mindsets around design thinking become beneficial because if new promising ideas come in from your empathetic forays into the world, right. uh, you can't just stop everything and implement that idea. You want to know if it works or not. And so the culture of prototyping, so another mindset, so radical collaboration, a culture of prototyping, means that we're prepared to do small mock-ups of ideas and test them out mm -hmm. in sort of in the live situation so that we, in front of the people they are designed to help, yeah. to get feedback, because then you know, one, one of the popular mantras of design thinkers is fail fast to succeed sooner. And so if we can create ideas that are potentially helpful, but test them out before they go to scale, we can save money, save time, save human resources. I would, I would ask people to raise their hand out there. I think if, you, if you've ever been in a um, organizational situation and been in a committee meeting, you've been in a the directorship of something and you've come up with an idea that you think will be wonderful for kids and uh, it's uh, funded and it goes out and nobody really likes it. This is happens all the time. And uh, Shane, okay. Shane raises and <laughs> there happened to you. Yes. And so Excellent. if, Excellent. if we had the opportunity <laughs> to take little ideas and test them out in, mm -hmm. in certain places and, right. and get the feedback, because that's the last step in the, in the prototyping cycle and that is the feedback find out if it works, then we can make, we can ask much smarter questions about scaling it, implementing it in new areas. And it gets to this problem about how every wicked problem is essentially unique because we're able to craft solutions that work for that setting. Mm -hmm. And then if we move it to another setting, it might work, but you can at least tweak it because you've understood what the needs are. So, so this is a little radical yeah. because in, in our field, we always, or not always, we often, roll out things that sound like good ideas from the expert's perspective mm -hmm. only to find that they don't work very yeah. well on the ground. And so we're, we're um, going to tilt that a little bit. Um, I think there's some other really um, good points. You all are doing great on the chat. Yeah. And so thinking about um, this idea about where do we even start with um, bringing design thinking and the ways in which we um, um, we bring it to bear on programs and thinking about these, this idea of parents who aren't so confident. And so with mm -hmm. design thinking, um, our goal is to set up an environment where through the ways in which we interact with parents and even children that make them comfortable sharing their mm -hmm. ideas and through empathy. Yeah. Yes. And um, Ellen's pointing out that parents aren't always competent to express what's working well or not so well. And so it can take time and skill to get that information from the parents. Right. Yeah. yeah. So maybe talk. Let's talk a little bit about this idea of, of empathy, and what are the mm -hmm. skills it takes to truly be empathetic um, and bring the voices yeah. of folks. So. We talk about empathy a lot, and in, in that stage of the design cycle where we engage in that, it's also broadly referred to as need finding. Sometimes, so there's a lot of things you can do. You can talk to parents, for instance. Let's just use parents as an example. Um, and maybe I'll use children also as an example in a second, but so a great way to understand the lives of another is to have a good conversation. And we use some protocols that allow us to structure that conversation in a way that really gets at what their 
what a person's aspirations are, what they think some of their uh, barriers are to those aspirations, um, and then some questions about the actual thing that we're concentrating on. Um, and we ask them some questions about what they favor about that, what they dislike about it. Um, also, we ask them to uh, express some information that they think they know that the people who are in charge don't know. We do a lot of this in schools. One of my favorite questions we have, we ask children uh, to say, so uh, in, in our regular education uh, program, we'll talk to grade uh, five, six, seven, eight year, uh, so eighth graders, and we'll ask them, what's something that the principal doesn't know but should? And that always gets a lot of really interesting responses because um, those people that are in the system and, and subjected to the system know a lot about it, uh -huh. but are never given an opportunity to talk about it and what works. Uh -huh. And so, and way deeper than say a satisfaction survey or right. a little needs assessment, but really having a conversation. So having a conversation is one way to gain empathy and understand others. Um, with children, uh, we, one thing we like to do is a shadowing. We help you just simply an adult watching, you know, people don't always, um, uh, express themselves accurately when they say what they do until you can really go watch what they do. So they may say they, they attend worship services frequently, but frequently means you know, once a year on a major holiday. So if you watch what people do, they actually um, are able to, um, you're, or you're able to find out what it is that their, and their needs are, how they operate, how they use things. So watching children use curriculum, watching them use manipulatives, things like tells you a lot about mm -hmm how they're doing that. We do photographs. We have, we have children. Uh, take, uh, everybody's nowadays has got a, a, a fancy camera on their phone. And so we have, uh, we'll have people that we're studying ask them to take pictures of what their lives are like and then have a discussion with them afterwards about what's in those photos and why that was important and why they took that. And so it's all painting a picture of what their lives are like and how we can make their life better. And so if we're thinking about inclusion, and as I'm looking at some of the comments, um, it does look different in every situation and with every family. Um, and especially in um, more uh, diverse settings where we're mm -hmm. trying to provide services within a culture that we might not really understand, or we might understand. Um, and it sounds to me like, um, you know, part of the beauty of design thinking um, is that we, we might have, I don't know, inclusion strategies that work in this setting but can't necessarily be transported right. to another setting. It's but like what Steve is asking a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what about the times that something works but in one area but maybe not others? And so that's, that's part of, a, of a, an iterative cycle uh, where uh, the parts that do work in the new setting, then great. But then it may... Uh, be that you go back to the uh, need finding and start to adjust that particular solution so that it can be effective. And so if that's the case, can, can design thinking be something that we teach people to be able to implement over and over again in their own programs and settings? Well, I'm biased in that answer. I think that the answer is yes. I think we can. I, I agree. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so part of what, what we we might think about yeah. and that we might want to be doing is figuring out how do we help um, early childhood educators become design, becoming human centered yeah. designers so that they can um, mm -hmm. implement things with their team. So, and yeah. collaboration is the key, right? So we have to have administrators yes. and teachers and families yes. and kids all part of the design. Yes. Process. Yes. You bring up an interesting point. And so, I'll say to, to two, two things to that. Firstly is how might we think about helping people leverage aspects of design thinking to improve their work? And so that can sound daunting. It's like, you want me now to become a design thinker and run an entire project? And we say, well, that's fine if you have the wherewithal and we can talk about how that might happen. However, there is no reason why you can't take small parts of the process and you don't have to do them in a linear fashion. I like to say start anywhere and go everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it could be as simple as bringing a sketch to a meeting and that's a prototype. And you say, here's an idea I was thinking about uh, and what do you guys think? And when people give talk about it, that's getting feedback. And then when you make the new one, that's the iteration. And then when you take that and show it to some parents and some kids, well now you're entered into need finding and you're starting to learn about it. So 
there's you can start small and just do small things. Um, so, is it, so it goes back to yeah. what you say to me all the time, which is, it's not the prototype, it's yeah. the feedback. It's the feedback, yeah. Right, so yeah, we I, don't, yeah, how I, Well, I tell my students when we talk about this and they work very hard on these sketches and how many of you have been in a place where you've made something really, really, you think is wonderful and cool and then no one really liked it or you're afraid to get the feedback because you think it'll be negative. And I just say to them, I'm sorry to inform you, but your ideas are not precious. Uh, and they deflated, but then I say, but the feedback you get on those ideas, that's the goal, because your idea is not to put something out there that you've made and is interesting for yourself, but rather it's about what you're going to be able to uh, do with that idea based on their feedback. Excellent, so that's the whole fail early to succeed. Fail fast to fail. succeed sooner, to yeah. I'd rather, sooner. I'd rather put out something crummy in a safe space to get feedback yeah. than put out something crummy in a big way yeah. that everybody doesn't like. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Let's see what some folks are saying. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, I, this was in from Libby. She said, in terms of trialing the solutions, what do you recommend about time frames for trialing? When working with early childhood services, I encourage them to try a new idea for long enough to see if it works. Uh -huh. You know, that's a great question. I mean, how long is long enough to see if it works? I guess um, maybe I use the example just from last night. We prototyped a solution in uh, the northern region of our state uh, where we used a design thinking process to understand the needs of uh, family provider care providers of early care and education services, right? right? So uh, child care centers inside homes, yeah. right? So family, family child care. We call that family child care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we learned quite a bit over this year of uh, understanding their needs and essentially that they wanted to be uh, respected, connected, and feel effective. And out of that, um, we looked uh, to actually solutions that already existed but had never been brought into this framework. And so we borrowed from the teach meet concept or maybe you're familiar with bar camps or unconferences but the, uh, these are uh, self-organized conferences uh, where the experts are the attendees so there are no fancy keynote speakers and nothing like that not us not us <laughs> and so and we uh, we might put ourselves out of a job <laughs> and so the uh, idea was to invite family care providers to their own conference and present to each other and they did last night. We prototyped this idea for the first time last night uh, with a dozen uh, providers, and it was pretty successful. So that was a two-hour meeting. We have enough information and feedback to know that we want to iterate on this, and we think we can go to other parts in the state. So mm -hmm. it just depends. It depends on the type of thing you're looking at and whether you've, you know, you've done it. Yeah. So what, what other questions, John, are up there that we can? Let's see. Um, Let's see, I think, let's see. Collaboration. Collaboration is the You're key, right. yes. So from Steve. <laughs> yeah, for uh, sure. And yeah. oftentimes the focus is look at what we did as opposed to what works for you, what doesn't work. Yeah, you Absolutely. nailed it. It is, and unfortunately many organizations create solutions for others that are really about the organization's needs. Exactly. Yeah. And I think I've experienced that <coughs> myself in our, in our design thinking process with coaches we've, we've done work with coaches who go in and provide services and supports um, for quality in child care centers. Mm -hmm. And I find myself all the time saying, oh, no, 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 we, we can't do that. And, and I have to be reminded, well, wait a minute, if, if this works for the provider, yeah. and if it works for the coaches and it meets their needs, then maybe it's not about me saying what we shouldn't do um, from the expert perspective. Right. Yes. That's hard. Yes. Yes, we've, well, we've seen that a little bit, um, even in this prototype we just did, where we saw a body of experts who expressed concern that the, the providers of childcare, could they be actually trusted to talk to each other? Yeah. Uh, like, uh, yes, they can. And, and yeah. yes, we think they can. And yes, we think yes. they can. Um, uh, Rosie says that one of the challenges in working with families who are just beginning the journey of recognizing and understanding and accepting their child's disability. Absolutely. You can talk so, to that. Yeah. yeah, and so with that, <laughs> um, I guess I guess part of what I'd say is um, maybe we need to think more empathetically about 
what's challenging about that for families. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, we, I think that's a that's a great answer. I mean, I think I bet I think research probably knows a little bit about why that is, but. Um, Again, because every situation is a little bit unique and it can be very enriching for providers to go out and really get to know their parents in that way. Um, you, working with the families in a way to help them uh, or help yourself be empathetic to what it is they're thinking as they recognize that they're yeah. uh, and understand and accept their child's disability. Well, and, and maybe the other thing, which is very radical, so I'll back off if you tell me to, is, is who has the need to make sure they recognize and understand. Is it the family's need to recognize and understand or is it our need to tell them that they need to recognize and understand? And so how do we begin yeah. to separate that out mm -hmm. in terms of what where our needs come in as experts and, and what are the family's needs and how do we separate those a little bit? Yeah. So um, what's the... What's the in yeah. inclusion? Oh, Kylie is saying that inclusion is a way of thinking, a way of being, and a way of making a decision or actions about helping everybody belong. Absolutely. So that's yes. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. <laughs> yeah. And so, how do what is what does belong look like from the child's perspective? What does belong mm -hmm. look like from the family's perspective? And what does belong look like from the expert's perspective? And how mm -hmm. do we bridge bring those yeah. together so that we understand the full picture? Yeah of what that might look like yeah. um, and what might work to help with that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so who has the need, experts or family? Very, uh, very, very exactly very right. Questions. Yeah. So. And I think that is the question that design thinking and human centered design has really helped me think about is, is when am I asking a question because I need to know the, the answer to that or I need to be in charge or how do I flip that on its tail a little bit and think about it from the perspective of the users. So I think the thing that, that made um, that, that you also talk about that never hit me until we started it on these projects together was um, this focus on the experience. And so, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. the whole human de human centered design is around how do we help kids and families, in this case with inclusion, have the best experience possible. Yeah, yeah I think that that's, thanks for bringing that up because um, I you know, don't want to take that for granted. Um, more and more as I have thought about the way in which design thinking could be brought to bear in improving education, I realized that a, a sort of a side, uh, a subset of design thinking, which is called service design thinking, really becomes more important to think about. So here's what I mean is that um, service design is the um, sort of the art and science behind making sure you have a great experience no matter what you're doing. Now you can imagine this occurs a lot in hospitality. So I mean, hotels are worried about the experience you have. Um, uh, if you go to a coffee shop, there are uh, coffee shops at gas stations and there are coffee shops like Starbucks and they both serve coffee, but they do it in a very different way. And people decide where to go, not based on the coffee always, but the experience they have. Um, I like to talk about the, sh the store in the States and they've hit uh, Australia. Zappos is a very big online retailer. Of, and you say, what do they sell? And most people say, well, they're a shoe company. But actually, if you dig into their work, they call themselves a service company that just happens to design shoes. And one of the reasons is because they are remarkable about their service, free shipping, free returns. They're very kind to their customers. They make it very easy to buy from them. And it's a pleasant experience. And so I wonder, um, what if we thought about schools as service organizations that just happened to... Uh, educate yes. kids and do inclusion that yes. what if it was about the experience because great experiences are what surprise and delight people and when people are surprised and delighted they stay with you they'll stick with you they'll want to be on your team they'll be collaborators yeah so if we kind of close out this by saying mm -hmm. what if we thought about inclusion <laughs> as we design inclusive experiences not from the perspective of whether kids have access and or can participate, but when kids are in those environments, um, are they having the best experience yeah. possible? And yes. so how do we focus on the experience that they have um, and then let that guide what we If do? you focused on the experience, 
without sacrificing quality and regulation. And, but if you made sure that the inclusive experience was so enchanting, right. then, then a lot of other things will follow from that if you make that the lead. Yeah. Yeah. So, Maybe. What do you guys so think? Yeah. yeah. And where do we go from here, John? Well, we're, we're coming up to the sort of the end of our little chat. So where do we go from here? Uh, my mind is spinning with ideas. Thank you. Us too. <laughs> Excuse me. For sure. <clears throat> so, uh, well, we will have a uh, blog number two. Uh, we'll come on uh, tomorrow, I think, where we talk about specifically some design thinking tactics that could come to bear on each of those four wicked problem uh, characteristics that we talked about for inclusion. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also be going out uh, to the, I'm going to share the screen, the Inclusion Symposium is coming up. And uh, I can uh, share a screen and show that right. Desktop too. Desktop too, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you get to see the chat too. All right, there we'll share you the go, screen. that's all right. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, uh, Inclusion Symposium 2017 is coming up. Uh, on the 30th of November, and so you can uh, visit that, yeah. uh, and I'll put that in the chat. And if you would like, if you happen to be one of our friends in New South Wales, uh, we'd love yeah. to see you there. Yeah. yeah. So we'll be talking a little bit more and really spending some time with, with folks there, um, mm -hmm. walking through the yeah. design thinking process, the tools and strategies yeah. that we've been working on. To We're going to workshop a little of the yeah. stuff. And how have, we've engaged yeah. children and brought children's voices into mm -hmm. the design of their classroom experiences. Yeah. So we're excited. Um, we're excited to yeah. chat with you all more we are. when we get there. We are. And if you want to just follow us on Twitter, in the meantime, it's a good way to reach out to us. You can message us there Absolutely. or, uh, uh, yeah, tag us and, and ask us a question. We're happy to talk out there as well. So. Yeah, and if you have suggestions for us, this is actually the first time we kind of webinared like this in advance. Mm -hmm. And so if you found it helpful, give us a, an email and let us know what worked and what didn't work mm -hmm. um, in terms of the yeah. webinar. Yeah, so, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, Beth. Oh, thank you, John. Yeah, and thank <laughs> you thanks to you all. Thanks to you all. And we will look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah. Okay. So. Bye for now. Bye for now. <laughs>